Grace and peace to you in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Good morning and welcome to Centenary United Methodist Church. My name is John Hiller. Welcome to the season of Lent. Today is the first Sunday of Lent, the 40 days in preparation for Easter. And we are on a journey towards the empty grave as we roll away the stone with our sermon series in Lent. And let me tell you what else we have going on at Centenary. Tonight at 5.30, our youth group and confirmation class will meet here at the church. I'll have dinner together, split off into youth and confirmation for separate lessons, and then have an activity together. Logos will meet this Wednesday at 4.30, and that's for our children and youth of all ages. As part of Lent, our care team has put together a care card table. You can find that in the Welcome Center. And you can write a care card to somebody in our congregation who's not able to join us here at the building to let them know that we are thinking of them. We'll be meeting Wednesday for our Lenten Luncheon Series, Wednesday at noon here at the church. Come enjoy a soup lunch and a devotion. Three of our centenarians were at Lincoln Elementary School this week, participating in Read Across America. Here's Sarah Riddle to tell us more about that. Good morning, Centenary. This is Sarah Riddle again, and we're here at Lincoln School for Read Across America this week. Uh, the principal, Oscar Castro, asked us to come and read to some of the classes. Dr. Seuss's birthday was yesterday, March 2nd. So we got to come today on Thursday, and we're sharing mainly with the primary grades this morning. As you can see, this book, Platitus Lost, is going to be a special treat for the four-year-old class and also the first grade. And I've read one already. The, ch the children were just in so happy and, and so well-behaved and so enthralled in the book. They just, they just loved it. And it was, a lot, it was my pleasure to be able to read it. I enjoyed it as much or more as they did. Uh, and thank you again, Centenary, for all you do for our missions and our Lincoln School. Thank you. And now, let us prepare our hearts for worship. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, warm me up a little bit. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, there's Sittenary. You all sound great today. Welcome to Sittenary United Methodist Church. We're so glad to have all of you who are here on campus worshiping with us, those who are next door in our contemporary service worshiping with us today, and those of you who are online worshiping today. My wife is home recovering from a surgery, and the first thing I, when I get home, she's going to tell me this is crooked. And uh, I'm looking in the screens, which is backwards, so it's really hard, but that's probably as close as I'll get. It is wonderful to be worshiping with you on this first Sunday in Lent. Lent, 40 days of preparation up to Easter Sunday. Those of you who uh, did well in math in school will go, wait a minute, that doesn't add up. That's because we don't count Sundays. Every Sunday, we celebrate Easter. Today is communion here at Centenary, and uh, all everyone is invited to the table who seeks Christ. You don't have to be a member of this congregation or this denomination. There's no age requirement. Uh, I remember a few years ago, we had a study group we worked on 
uh, sort of spelling out the rules for communion for the Methodist Church all over the world. And I represented Oklahoma on that committee. And we discussed whether should a person have to be baptized or confirmed before they came to communion. And we unanimously agreed, no, this is the table of Jesus Christ. Anyone who seeks Christ is welcome. And uh, so you are welcome to come. Tradition here, we sort of reenact what happened in the Last Supper. You come up the aisle, and uh, those of us serving will break off the bread, dip it in the cup like Jesus did. If you'll have your hands out, we'll place communion in your hands. And, uh, and then if you'd like, you can spend some time at the altar rail. There's also a great tradition in this congregation, a little basket here. And if you'd like to give a financial gift above your regular tithes and offerings, that money goes to support all of the feeding programs that we do out of Centenary United Methodist Church. We do a lot of feeding right here in our community in the area around the church, and that money goes to pay for the food that we give away to hungry people. It is a great and a wonderful day to be worshiping together. Let's raise our voices in praise. Good morning. Please stand for the choral call to worship. As we enter the wilderness of Lent, we, we rest, rest in the shelter of the, of the Most High. High. We abide in the shadow of the Almighty. We, we find refuge under, under the wings of our, our Holy God. God. We trust that the angels of God, the words of God, the people of God, and the hands of God will somehow bear us up. And so, so we call on God, who has promised to answer. to the table. Christ, our Lord, invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. 
Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. This proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. As we begin our prayer time, please notice that on the altar, there are sunflowers, the national flower of Ukraine. Let us pray. Almighty God, on this day of war and violence, we do confess to you, as the liturgy says, our sin. We confess our humanness and our brokenness. We confess to you that we long for peace. The day when the tanks the artillery and the things that make war will lie empty and rusting in the fields. The sunflowers will grow again. And the beauty of that place now torn apart by war will be restored. We confess to you, Lord, that in our daily lives we find ways to be in conflict as well. We each have wars that we fight times that we are unjust, times when we are a tyrant in our own ways. Forgive us, O oh Lord. Forgive us that we fail to be the people you have created and called us to be. Lift up our hearts and renew us in this Lenten season, even as we seek to be more obedient to you. Help us to give up things, even as Christ did in the wilderness. Help us to give up hate. Help us to give up the need for vengeance. Help us to give up the desire to take more and to have more while others have less. Bless us, O oh God, this day. And especially bless those people whose lives are being destroyed by the violence of war. We pray for your extraordinary protection of your angels over the churches of Ukraine and Russia today. We pray, O oh Lord, that they will be a haven for people who seek peace and that you will speak your sacred word of life to all those who gather there. We pray for the end of this war and for the end of all wars. In the name of the Savior Christ, amen. this time, would the ushers please come forward for the offertory? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Mighty God, as we remember the strength of Jesus facing the temptation offered by the devil, we remember too clearly how the temptations of food, of authority, 
and power have overcome us. We've been tricked to believe our wants were needs and more is always better. May we offer our gifts to you this day with generosity and gratitude. Strengthen us to resist temptation that would present security or power in anyone but you. In Christ we pray, amen. The scripture today comes from Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, it is written, one does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdom of the world. And the devil said to him, to you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple saying to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to protect you. And on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. This is the word of God for the people of God. 
Thanks be to God. The scene is a courtroom where one man stands on trial. His judge is an angel appointed by God who fills the role both of judge and jury. The prosecuting attorney is at his side 
and he is Satan. That old man, that old one, that old being, old scratch himself from the Garden of Eden story. The man on trial is named Yeshua in his language, translated to us as Joshua, and eventually in the English Bible as Jesus. He is not the Joshua that was number two to Moses, that was a previous time, and he is not Jesus, the Son of God, that will come later. He is Joshua, the high priest of God's temple. And he is on trial for being human. In this great heavenly course, not only will his fate be decided, but the decision will be made for the judgment of all humankind. The images and the scene from Zechariah 3 are powerful. The last book before the New Testament begins gives us an image of the state of human beings. In this Lenten season, we are supposed to reflect on who we are and be honest about who we are before God as we prepare ourselves for both the crucifixion and the cross and the majesty of the resurrection. We too face a trial. We too are accused of being human, sinful and frail. It's the trial is set in a time in Israel's history long ago, but with echoes that seem very familiar. Israel was a, a small nation, no threat to anyone. But next door there was a, a, a powerful, gigantic country, a nation called Babylon. And the emperor of Babylon was a, a megalomaniac who wanted all the land in the world and all the people in the world to bow down to him. He wanted people to see his glory, and so he extended his power, and by demonstrating his power, he thought people would give him glory. His armies pour into the tiny nation of Israel. The people there fight fiercely to defend their nation, their cities, their families, and their homes, but they are vastly outnumbered. They ask the Philistines to join them. They ask the Gibeonites to join them. They ask the people from across the Jordan River to come and fight with them, but no one answers. And eventually they are overwhelmed by Babylon. Their leaders and the best of their people are hauled away into slavery where they shall remain for many years. As they pray, they pray to God for deliverance. And a very strange thing happens. There is another nation even more powerful than Babylon, Persia. And Persia invades Babylon and defeats Babylon takes over all of these areas that have been conquered by Babylon, including Israel. And God moves in the heart of the emperor of Persia, a ruler named Cyrus. And Cyrus looks at the Jews and feels pity. Then he, he issues an order, freeing them to return home to rebuild their land, to replenish it and repopulate it, to build up their cities, including the great city of Jerusalem, to rebuild the temple of God and to worship God again in the temple. And in this moment of celebration and deliverance, when everything seems perfect, Satan calls humanity 
to account. Because we are sinful, because we are selfish, because we are broken, because we make war time and time again. And so the high priest of Israel stands accused of being human. Now, when I was a child and heard the story, it was very funny the way the pastor told it. Because in Hebrew, this priest, Joshua, stands there in the court, surrounded by the angels, and he's filthy and dirty. After all, he's been in war, he's been in battle, he's been a slave, he's been making the long journey that humans seem to have to make to find themselves and the life they should live. And he's covered literally in Hebrew by, how should I say it? Well, imagine if you went to the outhouse and you were sitting there and suddenly everything gave way and dropped you down. He's covered in whatever you'd land in. And as a small child hearing that, I thought that was very funny. The preacher covered in that kind of stuff. But the story is very poignant. And this book that leads up to the birth of Christ. Humanity stands on trial, covered in filth, found wanting in every way, accused by Satan of being impure and unworthy of God's love. Now move ahead, six centuries, let's say, and there was another young man whose name is Yeshua, sometimes translated Joshua and translated in our English Bible as Jesus. And he has been baptized, which has consecrated him for his mission in the world as Savior and Son of God. And to prepare himself to do God's work, he's gone into the wilderness. And let me just tell you, I've been there, the Judean wilderness is no place you want to spend your vacation at least not in the rough. It's hot and it's hard and there's not much that grows there and not much water. And Jesus goes there to fast and prepare himself for ministry. You know, in Luke's gospel, he talks about Satan more than any other New Testament writer. Luke, of course, writes the gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. And he starts out with this scene where Satan comes to meet Jesus in the wilderness. Later, uh, uh, Luke will tell us that, that Satan enters Judas, and that's why Judas betrays Jesus. He'll talk about how, how Satan attacks Peter, just as Peter is taking the leadership of the church, only Peter will be protected by Jesus' prayers. He talks about how a, a young Pharisee, Luke does, he is out, and he's, he's given his heart over to rage and anger, and he persecutes those first Christians, throws them in prison, and even worse, and he has an encounter with Jesus Christ that changes everything, and that young young Pharisee we know as Saul becomes Paul, the great evangelist. And Paul will state his purpose in life in one simple sentence. I am sent to deliver people from the authority of Satan to the kingdom of Jesus. So the character of Satan in Scripture, particularly in these stories in the Gospel of Luke, is extremely important. And then I want you to notice what power he has. Only the power to whisper and suggest and distort and to nudge and to tempt. I don't know if you know this, but when you're coming up from Texas on the highway to Lawton, just as you get to, to the, the outskirts of Lawton, there's a giant very beautiful billboard, well, well painted, uh, well lit, and it says, give in to temptation. For one of the businesses here in Lawton. Uh, you think I might be upset about that, but I admire the chutzpah of that, right? And, and I don't know what kind of marketing research they did. I don't know if they think that Lawton is just particularly enticing to Texans, or if they just think Texans are particularly weak and easily manipulated, I'm not quite sure what it is, but I think they have captured the essence of our culture, right? 
If you feel it and you want it, get it. If it makes you feel better right now, do it. Don't worry about the consequences. And that's what Satan says. When we were dating, my wife and I were dating, we dated for a long time. I don't think she was real sure about me, so we we dated for a very long time. She had two young daughters at home, so she was really checking me out. I have been seriously vetted. There's nothing the church can do to check my background that scares me at all because I've been vetted by Prudy, right? (laughs) And so we we dated for a long time, and we would get to Easter, and we'd be talking about, on this Sunday, we're always talking about this story because it comes up every year on this Sunday. And Prudy would say to me, I don't believe in a literal devil. She said, I just don't believe in that. She said, I think it's a symbol for for evil in the world, but I don't believe in the literal devil. She'd say, do you believe? And I'd say, well, you know, I believe in angels, and I believe in the virgin birth, and I believe most of that stuff in the Apostles' Creed. I believe all of that. So, yes, I take it all together. She said, well, I just don't believe in the literal devil. So we got married. It's not going where you think it's going. (laughs) It's not going where you think it's going. We got married, and she became a pastor's wife, Right? And she went through a couple of years of churches and church meetings. And one day we were walking out of a church board meeting and she leaned over to me and she said, I believe in the devil now. I've met him. (laughs) Right? There is something in this world that takes what's wrong and evil and the bad choices we make and amplifies it and makes it worse. Something that whispers in our ears that we are in charge and in control of our lives. Whether you believe that's a literal Satan being or you think that's symbolic language for that experience, I just invite you to let Luke tell you his story. In this story, Jesus has been in the wilderness 40 days and 40 nights. That's always a significant number in the Bible. Anytime you hear 40, you need to pay attention. It means a time of trial and testing. And Satan, the same Satan that put the old priest Joshua on trial, now comes to Jesus. And in each case, they're going to have an exchange. Satan is going to try to tempt Jesus in some way, like that big billboard on the outskirts of the city. And in each case, Jesus is going to respond by quoting words from the story of the Exodus found in the book of Deuteronomy which is Jesus' way of connecting who he is, saying, I'm the new Moses. I'm here to lead people out of slavery. Like the old Moses led people out of slavery in Egypt, I'm here to lead people out of slavery all over the world. And I'm making the journey that Moses and the people made in the wilderness. And I'll be true. At first, Satan comes to Jesus and says to Jesus, who's been without food for 40 days and 40 nights, I can't go 17 minutes without food. i got to tell you, worship's tough for me. Right? Take these stones and turn them into bread. I might have, if if Satan was tempting me, he'd say, take these stones and turn them into chocolate cake. But, But whatever works, right? Turn them into bread. Because part of what Satan does in tempting us, part of what temptation is, is is that we are tempted as human beings to take what's penultimate and make it ultimate. So penultimate means almost ultimate, but not quite. We are tempted as human beings to take what is important and make it the most important. This story is about identity and remembering who you are. For Jesus, it's about remembering who he is. The story is here for us to remember who we are and what is of ultimate importance in our life, doing the work of Christ in the world. And if you don't understand that, don't get it, just go back and and read what leads up to the story because it starts out right with Jesus is baptized and then he's consecrated for ministry and he's sent out into the world to do ministry. Wait, no, that's not how it goes. That's how Mark's gospel goes, but not Luke's. Now, in Luke's gospel, Jesus is baptized, consecrated for ministry. God says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then you get a lot of begats. You get this whole lineage of who Jesus is. My grandma would say, who are her people when I started dating? Right? 
And Luke tells us who Jesus' people are. The Southerners all smiled. I can tell which of you are really from the South. My grandma's from Chattanooga. Right? And Luke tells us who Jesus' people are. And he goes through this litany of people who are saints and sinners and kings and peasants and wealthy and poor and people who stood with God and people who stood against God. Jesus is made up of all these people who are us. Jesus enters the world to be with us to love us and walk with us, minister to us, and now Satan wants him to lose sight of that. That's his ultimate mission, but but Satan says, let's take that number two thing on your list, not starving to death, and, and let's move it up. And that's the temptation we face every day in our life. We get focused on things that are not the most important thing, but we make them the most important thing. And Jesus responds from Deuteronomy, Man does not live by bread alone. My wife reminds me often that women don't either, right? Bread is important. Food is important. Paying your mortgage is important. You know, getting your paycheck in the bank, those things are important. But they aren't the most important thing. I live with a dad, and every day my dad made a list, and at the top of the list he said, love Jesus Love my family. And then he listed all those other things he had to do during the day. And every night he could lay his pillow down, lay his head down on his pillow and go, well, I got number one done. I love the Lord. I got number two done. I showed my family I love them. Well, I didn't get the electric bill paid today. That's okay. I can go to sleep. I feel fine. Know what your priorities are in life. That's a part of your identity. And so then Jesus and Satan make a journey. And it's a different journey than the way the story is told in the other Gospels. For Luke, it's always moving towards Jerusalem, right? So before they go there, they go to the Mount of Temptation, what we call a traditional spot outside of Jericho. And Jericho is always kind of the edge of the world. It's kind of the edgy place in the New Testament stories. And he takes Jesus there and he goes up on top of the Mount of Temptation. You can go there today. It's a short cable car ride by your ticket and uh, eat at the nice restaurant below and have, have a really nice day visiting where Jesus and Satan once stood. I don't know about that. Uh, when we were on our trip with uh, folks from Centenary there, we had a very beautiful restaurant we ate at and had a giant feast celebrating the fact that we weren't being tempted that day on top of that mountain. But Jesus is. And remember, Jesus is representing all of humanity. That's what his lineage says. And all of us are in trial and Jesus. And the devil is the prosecuting attorney. He's trying to trick Jesus. And he says, come up on this mountain. Look, I'll show you all of the great places of earth, all the kingdoms. Remember those places that that had conquered your people? Remember all those places, all the places you've heard? I have authority over all those places. And if you worship me, I will give it to you. And right there is the core of the theme of the entire gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. Spelled out by Luke. See, the theme of of everything Luke has to say is is this battle between where Satan has authority in your life and where Jesus has authority in your life. And you have to decide who has authority and who you're going to follow. And Jesus chooses to follow God. Again, he remembers who he is, he remembers what his mission is, and stays true to it, and rejects power. If you don't think that's a big deal, look 6,000 miles on the other side of the globe at the war that's going on right now. That's about power. And we all exercise power in our own way, and in our own world. Examine your life. Where are you using power sinfully. And Jesus walks away from that. And so finally, Satan brings him to the heart of the place. He brings him to Jerusalem, and he brings him to the temple where where once that, 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 that high priest Joshua, who was on trial in heaven, where once he was to preside, he brings Jesus right to that spot. When we go to Israel, we go to the Mount of Olives, we come down, we go to the Garden of Gethsemane, and I look up on the Temple Mount, and I think of my Lord being there fighting for my salvation. 
He puts Jesus there on the temple and he says to Jesus, now throw yourself down because the scripture says God has appointed his angels to protect you. And that's a powerful temptation. It's a powerful temptation to say, well, God is supposed to take care of me. God loves me. I can do this. I can do that. It's all going to be okay. You'll hear it said in our culture today, God caused this or God has this plan. That's why that happens. Don't believe it. Not everything that happens in life happens because God wants it that way. God gives us free choice, and sometimes we make terrible choices. In that moment, Jesus is given what I call the great excuse. He can pick that. Do what you want to do and and just say, well, it'll be okay. God will work it out. God will take care of it. Somehow this will all work out as long as I get what I want. And Jesus once again quotes the Exodus story and says, Thou shalt not test the Lord thy God. In other words, don't put a relationship with God to the test. Don't do things to just see if God will be there. That's not trust. Our relationship is about trust. And the temptation we have in this modern world is to think that somehow we're in charge, somehow we have control, and we can do whatever we think we need to be secure and comfortable in the moment what's best for us and our loved ones, and not worry about how it affects anybody else because we don't trust God. To trust God is to stay on mission and to be doing the work of Jesus in the world. Where are you right now in your mission and calling? Are you doing the work in the world that Jesus has called you to be? This is the time to examine that carefully and decide what you need to change. It's an incredibly important thing. And when Jesus says no to that giant billboard the devil keeps throwing up that that, that says, give in to temptation, the devil keeps putting that billboard up and Jesus keeps saying no to it. Finally, it says the devil leaves to wait for a more opportune time, or as it says literally in the scripture, the best time to come back. And the lesson is, whenever we resist temptation, we have to understand that it will come to us again. To resist temptation is the hardest thing about being a follower of Christ. It's our calling, it's what we're supposed to do, and sometimes we fail, right? God has a promise, an incredible promise to continue to love us and call us to obedience. You go back to that courtroom in Zechariah where the high priest of Israel is standing there covered in filth, guilty by every count of being a sinner and a frail human just like me. And just as sentence is about to be spoken and his punishment is about to be announced, the voice of God echoes through the trial room. The court chambers are silenced by the word of the living God who claims the priest Joshua as his beloved child. Wash him. Make him clean, the Lord says. Cover him with the most precious robes. Put a crown upon his head. He's like a brand plucked from the fire. God said, I reach into the flames for you and save you. Because I love you. This is the word of God in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I wonder as I wander out under the sky Jesus the Savior did come for to die for 
The Lord be with you. you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the life. And when we turned away and our love failed, Your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenants to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so, with your people here on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach the good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. And on the night which he gave himself up, he took the bread and gave thanks to you. He broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave it to his disciples and he said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice, 
in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us, gathered here, and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. And by your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes again in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Would you please join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Like that priest in the story in Zechariah, none of us come to this place worthy, but the love of God makes us worthy. And that love is revealed in Jesus Christ, who took the bread and who broke it and said, this is my body, broken for you. And we many as we are, because we share this loaf, we're one. One with Christians in Ukraine, one with Christians in Russia, one with Christians all over the world, sinners redeemed by the love of Jesus Christ. On that same night, he took a cup and he lifted it up before them. And he said, this is my blood, the cup of the new covenant that I give to you for the forgiveness of your sins. By this cup and at this table, we are a forgiven people. Amen. Michaela, the body and blood of Christ.
The great preacher John Wesley, when he was describing his life, quoted that little scene from the book of Zechariah. He described himself as a brand plucked from the fire. Uh, That's what I feel like my life is. Someone who was just saved because of the love of God. And if you wish to receive the love of God through Jesus Christ into your life, it is offered to you this morning. It is a free gift that comes from God. It's what we call grace. All you have to do is receive it. We invite you to do that by being baptized. If you've not taken that step yet, that's that first step of saying, I want to set my my life aside for serving Jesus. If you've not become a member of a church, we'd invite you to make your church home here. Jesus died. He prayed. His last prayer before the crucifixion was for the church. This is where we live out our faith. We'd invite you to be a member here that you might serve Jesus from this home. And if you have any prayer need that you have, or maybe just the need to rededicate your life, I think that's always really powerful during the season of Lent, just to come up and say, Pastor, I want to renew my commitment to Jesus Christ. Uh, We'd love to have you do that as well. You be a brand plucked from the fire too. Come as we stand and sing. great joy it's been worshiping with you today 5 30 tonight youth and confirmation wednesday uh, we have our lenten lunches and they're really wonderful we had a tremendous crowd last week hope you'll come and join us and if you're looking for that one thing to do maybe to set aside lent to do just something a little extra and special there's a table right here just outside the sanctuary there are a list of our shut-ins there and there are beautiful cards there And you can write a card to one of our homebound people. Maybe you'd like to do that even each week. And then drop it in the basket and we'll send them for you so that they know we love them and we care so very, very much about them. Now I want to be real honest with you a minute. I know what some of you are going to do as soon as you have lunch. You're going to get on the highway, run down the highway, and come back up to see if you can see that sign. Give in to temptation, right? Okay, I understand that and it's okay if you do that. However, if you start getting out and getting pictures in front of it to put on Facebook going, (laughs) then we're going to have a chat, okay? (laughs) Join me in the sending forth, please. Christ meets us in our wilderness. You who have received now are sent to give.